Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, maybe I should say good morning or uh, good evening. We have a global audience. My name is Eric Bergloff. I'm the director of the Institute of Global Affairs here at the LSE School of Public Policy. We're absolutely delighted to host, be hosting this panel together with the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics. It's part of a series that we are doing um, on COVID, but we're also doing this part of a project called the Stockholm School of Governance. It's the idea is to build an environment with many universities uh, collaborating on teaching and research on complex coordination problems that are associated with the transformation to sustainable economy globally. And of course, there's probably no better illustration of what it takes we're looking at the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And of course, we see all the lack of preparedness and all the fragilities in many societies. The Swedish experience from fighting COVID-19 is obviously of interest to Sweden. But as we can tell to, from the number of Swedes who have signed up to this webinar, it's clear. But the interest in the Swedish exception goes much beyond that. Again, the sign up for this seminar shows this. The discussion in Sweden has become very heated, uh, but the Swedish exception is also being banded around in many countries in support of domestic policies or to show what happens if you follow another set of policies than those recommended by that particular government. So, so we wanted to have this debate now, not because we know for sure what the outcome of the Swedish experiment will be, it is too early to say that, but we wanted to understand the arguments for the Swedish policy, what the strategy was, how it was played out, uh, how, how it has played out so far. We also want to understand why did Sweden and no other country or very few other countries choose this model. I don't think I would either would like to exaggerate the differences between Sweden and other countries. In, in, in the end, it's mostly a matter of degree and of timing. But, and how does it compare to the historical experience in Sweden? And how does it compare to Sweden's approach to other challenges, all those issues we wanted to come to today. The most interesting comparisons are probably with other Nordic countries with similar social and political models. But it's also interesting to ask, to what extent is the Swedish experience relevant from countries, for example, with, where stricter lockdown policies are more difficult to adopt or, or even impossible to adopt. We are meeting now in a time when the epicenter of the epidemic has traveled from China via Europe to the United States. And uh, of course, it's now going to also take hold in the emerging and developing world. It's very clear that these are sort of two intertwined um, crises that, that we will have to deal with. And um, we want to look at what can we learn from the Swedish experience. Where is it relevant? Where is it not relevant? We have a fantastic uh, group of speakers, and I will introduce them um, uh, after uh, one after the other as they speak. And, but the first, I wanted to have a chance for um, someone who's been uh, relatively close to the uh, Swedish experience and, and the, uh, su the uh, Swedish um, uh, planning on, and, and uh, implementation of the Swedish uh, model. And that is uh, Tom Britton, who is a professor of uh, epidemiology at Stockholm University. And he has been part of, of the team working on uh, trying to produce the models that are being used as a basis for the Swedish, uh, uh, ex uh, the Swedish experiment. So Tom, can I let you go first? Yeah, okay, so this is me. I'm a professor at Stockholm University. Uh, my background is mathematics and statistics. So for those who are, don't know much about Sweden. It's a country of about 10 million people. So far, we have um, slightly less than 2,000 case fatalities. Uh, right now, the number of case fatalities is not increasing, but uh, rather stable. I would say that it varies between 70 and 80. And this uh, statistics include people dying in elderly homes. There has been a discussion, at least in Sweden, that some countries have uh, only people dying in hospitals, whereas other countries have people dying in elderly homes. And the Swedish statistics include the later. And also the situation at uh, intensive care units is quite stable nowadays, still very high numbers for us, 
but uh, not increasing for the moment as it seems. So I think that we have about 50 to 60 new admissions per day. Of course, they, they are there for a longer period of time. So I think, I think that the current number is around 400 people in all of, all of Sweden staying in uh, intensive care units. I have heard, although I'm not an expert, that a surprisingly big fraction survive, so actually leave the hospital uh, later on. 80% was something I heard in the news. Uh, so these were, what I said now was sort of facts, let's say. And then uh, there are some estimates, which there is quite a lot of uncertainty around. Well, one thing that is for sure is that the transmission is dominated in Stockholm. So that's where we have most of the cases. Uh, some estimates of how many that have been infected up to now vary in the range between 20 and 25 percent, maybe even slightly higher. I wrote a very rough report uh, a week ago saying that it might be even more than 30 percent, but now there are better reports suggesting that it is rather 25 percent or even slightly lower. There is, of course, quite a lot of uncertainty in these estimates. For the whole country, there, it's even more uncertain. I'm just guessing now, but it could lie around 10% that have been infected nation, na nationwide. And what is our policy uh, for it? I think most of our intervention started around mid-March. There are a few regulations, but I would say that most things are not regulations, but rather strong recommendations. The regulations are a few and they are that high schools and universities are closed, gatherings with more than 50 people are no longer allowed, and restaurants have some restrictions that you cannot stand up in restaurants and the table have to be you know, distant apart. I don't know the exact distance, but they have to make it fewer. That's not a problem though because uh, at least indoor, very few people go to restaurants these days. Yeah. Outdoor, more people go, I would say. Even, even a month ago when it was very cold, you could see people sitting outside. And now the weather is getting nice, finally in Sweden, and then it's quite crowded on the outdoor seating restaurants. Uh, how about the, the recommendations? The strongest one is for the 70 plus people. They are strongly encouraged to self-isolate and only go out for walks, uh, not go into any shop whatsoever. Some do, but I think most people obey this. Uh, another recommendation is that if you have any type of symptoms, you should not go to work and you should recover and stay two days additionally at home. Another recommendation is that everyone who has the possibility should work from home. Another one is to avoid public transport in particular during rush hour, although there are no rush hours nowadays. And the final one, which was given a bit later, I would say, is that people should social distance themselves. Um, finally, what do I think about this? policy. I think that uh, in the beginning, uh, the Swedish Public Health Agency did not take uh, this serious enough. They said it will probably not strike us, but eventually they have realized it will. Uh, and another thing is that I think there is a, not enough testing. Now they are starting to test on, on uh, higher scale in particular for healthcare workers and people working in the elderly homes. Uh, I think that the policy has been consistent all through and I would summarize it as follows that it is to reduce spreading, protect the elderly and other risk groups and keep the society functioning. And maybe as Eric or as I saw in an announcement here is that trust, uh, trust uh, the citizens that they will follow our recommendations. Uh, and it has been debated earlier if we should have a lockdown, but my feeling is that uh, now uh, most people support the current uh, uh, policy. That was
my little presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. I should have said that, of course, uh, everyone on this panel today has uh, some Scandinavian connection. And so we are, I guess, three Swedes and um, a, um, a Norwegian and a Dane. And Peter is of Danish extraction, though he's American and has, but he's married to Swedes. So it's a truly Scandinavian uh, conspiracy today. But it's also uh, a chance to maybe compare uh, the different experiences um, across uh, uh, the Nordic countries. The next uh, speaker is uh, Lars Tregord, who is a historian and worked a lot on uh, understanding the Swedish model, both from a historical and a comparative perspective. So, and you have been, of course, quite uh, vocal in this debate around the, this, uh, this uh, Swedish experience. So, Lars, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for organizing this event. Um, I think it's uh, qu quite needed. You know, there has been today, in fact, an article in the Dagens Nyheter, the leading daily in Sweden, about um, the relative high rate of misrepresentation in international media about what actually is going on in Sweden. Uh, so I think it's very welcome, you know, to have an event uh, of this sort. Um, first of all, I'd just like to reiterate something that I think both Tom and Eric uh, were bringing up, which is that there is a sort of misconception a little bit, I think, about Sweden. Uh, uh, some social memes which suggest that, that it is just sort of one big after-ski party in Stockholm. And uh, this is actually quite far from the truth. Um, uh, Sweden is much more similar uh, to most countries when it comes to the exercise of social distancing. Uh, so that, I think, is a very important point just to bring up. We should not exaggerate the differences. Um, so, so that's, you know, the first point that I want to make here. Um, the second one uh, re regards also thinking about differences. Um, we have had, I think, an unfortunate, very superficial discourse uh, so far on positing um, lockdown, you know, versus a lax approach, you know, and that usually is the lax approach is Sweden and the lockdown is the rest of the world. Um, and I think this is not a very, this, these are empty categories, essentially. So if we want to talk about Sweden, we need to talk about specifics, the concrete, you know, what is actually going on? What is it that is different? Um, and there are two things that I want to point to here. Um, the most important, perhaps, and there's been a certain amount of debate, but mostly just observations, really. Uh, it, it regards preschools and the primary schools. Uh, this is where Sweden stands out. And... Um, and this is a very important matter because it, it highlights something that Tom was suggesting, right? That is, is a concern that goes beyond, you know, uh, let's say mortality or death rates uh, and concerns itself with the health of society, right? This is a social disease. It attacks society, not just individuals. Uh, and why are the schools so important uh, in Sweden? Um, I think this has to do with this sort of status of children's rights and gender equality. Uh, closing primary schools right, for children is, is a very big matter. Uh, for older children, students in the university, gymnasium and so forth, distance learning is, is a realistic option. That's not really the case uh, for, for preschoolers or those in primary schools. Um, and that means that for, from an egalitarian children's rights perspective, keeping schools open is, is absolutely essential. Uh, I get the question often, you know, how can you not close the schools? And I say back, how could you even think about closing the schools? And, and we're now seeing new research coming out of a study in Iceland also showing uh, that uh, there are also no particularly good medical reasons right, for closing the school. So this is important, but it also affects gender equality. You close the school, uh, parents have to come home, leave work. Many of them that do that then would be women. We know this from statistics. Uh, and on top of that, many of them are working in healthcare section and other types of care areas. So it, it has a series of ramifications. So I think the reasons for keeping schools open are very strong, and there is a high degree of support. I, in fact, I still have to meet anyone that I know among people I know who have kids who will seriously argue uh, against open schools. So that's the, the one sort of concrete difference, I think, that's where Sweden stands out. The second one is a more general principle, uh, which we also heard Tom uh, talk about, namely that we have chosen, right, not a mandatory lockdown, right, sort of criminalizing certain types of behaviors, 
but rather we're resting it on an approach that's based on trust, on voluntary participation, on a shared responsibility, a notion of individual responsibility, uh, that is to say, a, a policy based more on, on trust than on fear. Uh, now, we can argue about that, of course, but when we look at data coming out now, we'll just look at sort of compliance data, shows looking at the degree of social distancing in Sweden and different countries. Uh, the differences are not particularly dramatic. Uh, so, the, so certainly it appears that this voluntary approach uh, is in fact working. Um, the big other argument here is about sustainability. Uh, closing down society, social closure, uh, is not sustainable in the long term. It's predicated really on a very, very short-term success in finding a vaccine or a cure. Should it last longer, right? The sustainability here, it becomes crucial. And I think this is another argument that's being made in Sweden, uh, that we are sort of trying to look at it both from an individual societal perspective, both in what is sustainable in the short and in the longer term. These are, are sort of critical arguments. Um, and those becoming more relevant now that we see a global discussion turning more towards how do you open up society? Uh, you have notions like whack the mold, right? The idea you should open up and close again. Now that might be mathematically possible, but if you're looking at real social life, of course, it's not a very tenable solution. You can't sort of open the school one week, close it the next week and reopen and so forth. Uh, the, um, um, the third point I wanna make, right, is that uh, there is a lot of recognition in Sweden, and there's a very important debate around the failures uh, that we see here that are not actually so much related to the coronavirus crisis, but are hugely important. Namely, one, the failure to protect the elderly in institutions, and the second, uh, the, the large proportion of those who are sick and, and dying that are in immigrant neighborhoods. Uh, now, these speak to longer term issues, right, about, let's say, neoliberal reforms of the welfare sector in Sweden that's been going on for some time, failures when it comes to integration policies. Uh, these are going to be hugely important issues uh, in the longer term, uh, and that these constitute short term failures within the context of the corona crisis, there's no question about, very important. But they are not merely or simply questions about the corona crisis policy. Uh, it's not clear that, uh, uh, that that would have been much different had we gone for some form of lockdown. So those would be my opening uh, points, because I know we are supposed to be relatively brief to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. And uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Peter Baldwin. So Peter has, and, and the reason why he's on here is that he has worked on the history of um, uh, health policies uh, across different European countries, particularly Britain, France, Germany, and Sweden. Uh, he has also looked at the difference globally in, in how we addressed uh, HIV AIDS. And, and so we thought putting this in a historical perspective and also uh, a, a wider perspective of how different countries deal with um, uh, health scares or, or um, uh, pandemics. So please, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. I should say, Peter, also that Peter is a professor at the UCLA and the New York University. Please, Peter. Um, thank you, Eric. Uh, I hope I'm not going to add more grist to Lars's mill about Scandinavia being misrepresented in the greater world. But as the least uh, Scandinavian person here on the panel, I may go in a slightly less consensual direction than some of the others. And I'd like to sort of firm up the distinctions a bit because effectively the Swedish approach to coronavirus comes really entirely unexpected. I don't want to mince words. Sweden is a country that is very interventionist in every other respect. Drug addiction, alcohol use, prostitution, and it's verboten or at least very highly regulated. So the question is, why have the Swedes decided to go all liberalist precisely in the midst of the worst pandemic of a century? Well, the first problem is to determine what exactly the Swedish approach is. Now, it has to be said, it is not herd immunity. It is not deliberately letting people get affected so as to generate immunity, everyone denies that. Instead, what the Swedes say is that it is doing what other nations are doing, but in a voluntary way that it does not require compulsion. Now, if that's true, then epidemiologically, there's actually no difference between the Swedish and other nations' tactics. Everyone is trying to flatten the curve to spread the cases out over a longer time. The difference is tactical. Maybe it's due to trust, 
maybe it makes more sense to call it obedience, but either way, it amounts to the same. The rules are followed one way or another, whether you do it through voluntary compliance or whether you do it through law enforcement. Sweden's refusal to impose a mandatory lockdown is not out of line with other nations. There are other nations that are following a similar course, but the company that Sweden is keeping is rather unusual. Its fellow Scandinavians, Denmark, Norway, Finland are not following this course, but Iceland and the Netherlands are, South Korea has been, but the nations that are most vehemently against the lockdown also include the so-called ostrich alliance, the dictators with their heads in the sand, Nicaragua, Belarus, Turkmenistan, and above all, Bolsonaro's Brazil. These are among Sweden's peers in this approach, and of course, they're a rather motley bunch to say the least. I know Tories in the UK who are amazed that their libertarian right-wing friends would ever have found occasion to hold Sweden up as a model, but now they are. So the question is, where does this unexpected approach come from? Swedish journalists have claimed that there's a kind of native tradition of voluntarist public health that's being followed. That sounds nice, but it seems to me it is simply not the case. Sweden is out of line with its own past. Historically, Sweden has clamped down firmly on contagious diseases. During the first cholera epidemics in the 1830s, Sweden imposed one of the most strict quarantine systems anywhere. For smallpox, Swedes mandated compulsory vaccination already early in the 19th century. For sexually transmitted diseases, the state was even more draconian, not just sex workers, but all infected citizens were obliged to be treated. Anyone who refused to be treated, who refused to abstain from sex could be jailed. This wasn't just some kind of outmoded approach from the dank reaches of the 19th century, because the same tactics were continued in the 1980s when the AIDS epidemic hit. So what I'm trying to say is that the new voluntarist approach to coronavirus is indeed a dramatic change of direction. And the question is, why do we have this U-turn? We all know that everybody is welcome to change their minds. Indeed, we encourage changing of minds, especially when the facts change. But have the facts changed? What is different about this disease to justify this sort of novel approach? Well, it seems to me it's easier to eliminate the reasons that do not explain the Swedish turnabout than it is to account for why it happened in the first place. It's clearly not the outcome of native traditions. And here's another reason why they cannot be the cause. The Swedish exception has nothing to do with politicians deferring to expertise. The Swedes often claim that they're leaving the important decisions to the experts and to science. <clears throat> but that is in effect what every political leader claims. The problem is that the experts don't speak with one voice. Politicians pick and choose among the conflicting recommendations that they're given. There are many Swedish experts who are against the current approach, but they're not the ones who are being listened to at the moment. The final point that I want to bring up is the question of whether or not the Swedish approach is working. If you look at the immediate outcomes, that is to say, if you look at the per capita death rates now, the answer is clearly no. For Sweden, they're almost three times higher than they are in Denmark. They're seven times higher than they are in Finland. Even worse, Sweden stands at place 10 on the global list of all nations ranked in this respect. If you look just at the death rates, you'd say that Sweden was doing something terribly wrong. Now, one reason for these Swedish rates and their highness is that the authorities have refused to acknowledge asymptomatic carriers as an issue. Silent carriers are a special problem when you take a voluntary approach. If you don't test, you can't find them. If you don't test, you don't know how many there are. And it doesn't matter how much social trust is out there in a society, the silent carriers still don't know that they're vectors. Now, it is true that we won't know the real outcome of these different approaches for many years. And it may be the case that in the long term, the outcomes of lockdown on the one hand and the outcomes of the Swedish approach may look quite different than they do right now. But of course, the long term analysis cuts both ways too. Collateral damage attends also to lockdown. There are people who are harmed by being shut in. There are people who commit suicide because they're depressed. There are people who fail to get treatment for existing sicknesses. All these things are collateral damage in a lockdown scenario. But there's an upside as well to the lockdown strategy, which also has to be factored in. There are fewer violent crimes and murders. There are fewer traffic accidents. There are fewer workplace accidents. There's less pollution. There are fewer deaths attendant upon pollution. All of these things will have to be considered in the long run. But one hint that even this long-term calculation might not favor the Swedish approach comes from the tendency to avoid treatment for existing illnesses. 
In other nations, nations that are locking down, hospitalizations have decreased dramatically during the lockdown for heart attacks, strokes, for appendicitis, things like that. Now, obviously, people are not magically becoming healthier. So either we have a large number of excess deaths that are occurring outside of hospitals, or there is a future wave of non-corona related mortality that we're somehow holding off during the lockdown, which is eventually going to break over us once it's over. Now, if the Swedes trusted their institutions, we would expect to see a difference here. Swedes would be going to the hospitals for non-corona related issues in the same way that they continue to live their lives more normally in other respects. But apparently that's not the case. Those seeking treatment for heart attacks is down 25 to 50 percent since the start of the epidemic. So apparently Swedes don't trust their own hospitals either any more than patients do in the lockdown nations. It seems to me, and with this I will end, it seems to me that there's a muddle at the heart of the Swedish approach. Anders Tegnell, who's the chief epidemiologist, was quoted three days ago saying the following. According to our modelers, we're starting to see so many immune people in the population in Stockholm that it's starting to have an effect on the spread of the infection. It's hard to say how he knows this. We're not yet even sure that having had the disease confers immunity. Antibody testing is still a mess. There are no reliable tests. And the Swedes have been doing mass testing, even if they could have. But the point here is that it sounds as though Tegnell is actually aiming at herd immunity, even though the Swedish authorities deny that that's what they're after. And here it seems to me is precisely the basic dilemma. You can have either voluntary measures where citizens do on their own what in other countries they have to be ordered to do, or you can have herd immunity, but you can't have both at the same time. If you're getting herd immunity, then people are not voluntarily obeying the rules that they should be following. And I conclude, therefore, that we're left still with a mystery of why it is that the Swedes are pursuing this course. On that note, <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you for this uh, very interesting historical and, uh, comparison and also a very precise analysis of the current uh, policy in, in, the, in, the, in Sweden. The, the next speaker is uh, Sarah Herman. Sarah is a colleague of mine at LSE and Deputy Dean of the School of Public Policy. She has worked extensively on, on uh, issues related to political processes and representation in the European Union, transparency in politics. And, and you're going to talk a bit about the politics of uh, COVID-19 across Europe, but also in, in Scandinavia, I think. Yes. I will. Thank you so much, Eric, and um, to all of you for this. I think it's fascinating to 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 look into um, this fast evolving um, uh, process that we are we are all living at the moment. Um, yeah, I'll try and, and say first a few things about uh, the great variation we see in the Nordic countries, and then um, broaden it out to um, what's happening at the EU level, um, because to my mind. Um, we are seeing certainly a huge um, health issue, but as Lars pointed out earlier, it's, a, it's also an issue that is uh, hitting our societies and our, uh, the political landscape in Europe. Uh, governments are going to fall over uh, the actions they take during this crisis. Some might also um, uh, see an increase in support, of course, but there will be great implications politically and economically for, for, for our societies as well. Now, um, uh, the Swedish uh, um, uh, strategy has been puzzling for many, uh, and it is interesting to compare it to its uh, neighbors uh, because of the great similarities, of course. The Nordic countries are very homogenous in, in, um, in their welfare systems, in their healthcare systems, but nevertheless, um, I think it's very important when we make these comparisons that we keep in mind that uh, there are some differences that are uh, of defining uh, nature in, in the, the, uh, the response that is required with the coronavirus. For, of course, the fact that we have very um, uh, great variation in the population size, uh, in geography and the demographics, uh, and these require different considerations and interventions. Um, 
but that still doesn't explain the, the, the differences in strategy by the, by the governments. Um, so um, as we now see Sweden um, take uh, new measures and getting uh, into perhaps uh, further restrictions, uh, on the other hand, here in Copenhagen, why I'm, I'm based, uh, at least for, for the moment, um, um, we are seeing schools open up this uh, week after a much more restrictive uh, uh, set of interventions from the government, and the same has been the case in Finland uh, uh, and in Norway as well. So um, Sweden does stand out in the Nordic picture in this respect, um, and uh, there may be uh, implications of this, but. Um, apart from the differences um, in, uh, that I just mentioned with re regards to demographics, I think it's very important that we also uh, highlight the um, rural and city um, uh, implications. And there, um, it seems to me that the Swedish uh, uh, challenges are very much linked, of, of course, to uh, how... Um, the response has been in Stockholm, in Copenhagen, the, or in Denmark rather, the um, uh, concentration has also been in Copenhagen, but not to the same degree as we see it in Sweden. So uh, we have had different considerations of the capital to the rural districts, which have not been the case in, in Sweden so far. Um, another issue is, of course, that we are um, at very different stages of the pande pandemic across the Nordic countries. Um, Denmark uh, was uh, uh, affected quite early on in the process, uh, simply because a lot of people came back from northern Italy from ski holidays, where I think the Swedes may have stayed skiing in Sweden. Uh, and certainly that has been sort of a, a popular uh, uh, version of why, why we are where we are in Denmark, that we were hit so early on um, and uh, the government's response was, was immediate uh, and with um, very uh, strong restrictions put into place, which were accepted and followed uh, and supported by the public. There was a very um, good communication from the government regarding the uh, medical um, advice that were given to them. And this was presented in a way where that um, created confidence and um, uh, uh, support for the government's actions. Um, I'd say that, and this goes for, for all countries who are living through this now, that of course, um, the immediate uh, responses to the coronavirus are, uh, have, are defining for, for, for the following process. But we are now witnessing in Denmark that this second phase where we are starting to open up the country is um, quite a different kind of process. And here um, the government cannot refer to the expert advice on how to gradually introduce um, uh, more and more uh, social interaction, uh, how to, what strategy to put in place for opening up further um, educational um, places, etc. So um, here the government is all, all, um, almost left on its own with the strategy and how to develop the, 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 uh, the, the further process and will have to take responsibility for that and I'm very curious to see how that will go down um, with the public and with what consequences that will come out of this process because I think the two phases um, uh, have, that we have seen uh, here in Denmark have been handled very differently and are uh, potentially uh, going to experience very different kinds of public support um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a communication issue, but it's also an economic, social and medical uh, 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 process to go through now. Um, but um, I think that if we look at this uh, even broader than just the Nordic uh, picture, uh, it is clear that um, the economic uh, consequences are very dire of this uh, coronavirus. Uh, and will hit um, countries differently across Europe. Of course, with the countries um, um, being hit the worst and early on in the process, also seeing um, that they are now the ones struggling the most. 
Um, and therefore, uh, it is uh, really a very important moment in the history of the EU. Uh, this week, you will see the um, meeting between the EU leaders on Thursday, tomorrow, uh, which will in most likelihood define uh, what kind of political and economic interventions um, uh, are to happen from the EU level. Uh, and I, I am I'm convinced that this is a, a key moment for the um, further governance and for the further economic uh, 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 sustainability uh, of the continent, in fact. Uh, there's huge disagreements between the countries in how to handle this. Um, there are uh, very different expectations from uh, Italy, uh, Spain, compared to some of the uh, northern countries led by Germany. But I think that important steps are, are being taken and uh, there is a great deal of um, uh, solidarity and uh, um, uh, 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 real efforts being put into finding ways to, 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 to address the coronavirus implications uh, economically. Uh, but um, th th I'm convinced that what comes out of this will have implications for the kind of collaboration and the kind of um, uh, uh, landscape we see, we see in Europe going forward. Of course, a country like Sweden, uh, or Denmark for that matter, uh, sitting outside the Eurozone is having to uh, play a, a, a key role already from the very beginning in order to ensure that they will have uh, influence in the longer term. Um, so I think that it's important that um, we, 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 we keep focused on the, on the domestic I think so. but also from the... Now uh, or than that? ...for the broader EU uh, landscape. Um, I will stop here, Eric, um, and, uh, but I'm happy to elaborate. Yeah. Uh, later on. So thank you very much, Sarah. And um, the the last speaker um, on on this panel is uh, a Norwegian, uh, the Ole Petter Ottersen, who is known to most Swedes as the uh, rector of the Karolinska Institute. But he's a neuroscientist um, in the background. Has worked a lot on sort of global health, global governance issues. So. Uh, Ulle Petter, please, the floor is yours. Let me first say that it's a privilege to be part of what you call, Eric, uh, a Nordic or Scandinavian conspiracy. And uh, it has been a privilege indeed for me as a Norwegian to compare the uh, Norwegian and the Swedish uh, strategy when it comes to uh, this pandemic. And um, I guess that there are three issues that I would like to address. Most of my points have been taken by um, the other speakers, but uh, three points remain. And I think that these three points are um, adequate following up of what has been said thus far. The three keywords are humility, humbleness, when confronted with uh, a treacherous enemy like um, the new coronavirus, that's number one. The whole picture when it comes to health, this is something that is missing from the debate today. Um, I think Peter touched on the term collateral damage, and that is something that really belongs to this whole picture when it comes to health. And the third keyword that I think is so essential is that uh, we as countries, we are becoming quite myopic in this debate. We are not looking across the borders. We are not taking into account the global dimension of this pan uh, pandemic sufficiently. So these are the three issues that I would like to raise. Humility, the whole picture, and the global dimension. It's interesting when we discuss uh, the contrast between Norway and Sweden that, um, well, Norwegians very often are held to say that, uh, well, we have the right recipe. The same thing goes for Sweden. But in fact, when we are looking now into what the public health authorities say about this issue, there is quite a lot of humility to statements. Just uh, a few days ago, there was a debate on these uh, differences between Norway and Sweden. And um, a representative, top representative, through the Forlan of the uh, Norwegian health authorities or uh, public health agency, said, and I quote, I'm 
translated this to English myself, it's hard to say this less about the Norwegian approach if this is a better strategy than the Swedish one in the long run. And I think this is exactly the humility that we have to apply to this discussion. We simply don't know which of these different strategies will be the best one. It will take years to find out which one is the best. And I think this has to be brought into the debate. We are in a situation where the debate much, must be colored by the uncertainty at hand. The virus simply doesn't come with a manual as to what measures should be taken to protect the society. It doesn't come with a manual as to how uh, this uh, disease should be diagnosed or treated in the best possible way. This calls for humility, and this is what I really lack in this discussion. And uh, with uncertainty also comes misconceptions and misrepresentations and outright lies. So I think this is one of the values of this uh, webinar that we have now, that uh, we can try to kill some of the myths that have uh, appeared in the literature regarding these different strategies that we have also in the different Nordic countries. So I must say, honestly, that I've been surprised and uh, in some instances shocked by the way that data or lack of data have been handled in this debate. Now is the time to really stick to the evidence at hand because evidence is coming up as to how we should deal with this pandemic. The, the second issue uh, is the whole picture. And uh, we are discussing in different Nordic countries the relationship between the public health authorities, the expert authorities, and uh, the political level, the government. And uh, the interesting thing is, of course, that uh, the expert authorities, they are experts, yes, in how viruses are transmitted, the diseases are transmitted, uh, epidemiology, uh, modeling, and so forth. But what the pandemic is, is a disease that hits through all sectors in society. And we have, as was said here, collateral damage across sectors. And uh, of course, to inform authorities, we need much more expertise as to how this coronavirus impacts the health, the whole picture when it comes to health like the health effects of isolation, like the health effects of unemployment, like the health effects of having to cut down on the treatment of all the diseases. The last and third point, and this is really where I think we have to have a much more focus in our debate, is the global dimension of this uh, pandemic. A global crisis requires a global response. It's disheartening to see how uh, the US how Donald Trump is cutting down on the um, uh, support of uh, WHO, for example. But WHO is um, global governance of health, not for health. We need to have, before the next pandemic appears, uh, cross-sectoral governance for health. So we can look at, as I said, the whole picture of health when a crisis hits. The economical issues the uh, issues that pertain also to uh, the coupling to climate and not least to inequities. What this pandemic does is to unveil inequities, inequalities, injustice in our society. As was said, minorities are hit hard, much harder than the population at large, just to take one example. Um, the last thing when it comes to uh, the global and international, it's interesting that uh, what we are discussing now is a pandemic that hits the Nordic countries. Next time around, I think we should see to it that we have, if possible, at least a Nordic alignment of our responses. The longest, as far as I know, border between two countries in Europe is, you guess, between Sweden and Norway. And yet these two countries that follow different paths different strategies. This will be very, very difficult to handle when we are sort of uh, opening up in the next stage. Let's go for a Nordic response or a Nordic alignment of responses the next time around. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ulle Petter. Well, we have a lot of questions from the audience and I would like to uh, 
call on some people who have uh, put forward question. Can uh, maybe you can introduce yourself when you uh, ask the question. Giancarlo Spagnolo, are you there? A very brief question uh, in terms of research. Uh, I think in Sweden, folk health some indicator has been very, very bad at communicating the reasons between their uh, strategies, the foundation of the model, and so on. But they may get, you know, get a different, uh, uh, they may have got it right. My question is there is evidence, empirical evidence, I uh, put a link on the chat, uh, suggesting that policy should be different in Italy, Spain, and France, where you have an explosive contagion, from policies in Germany, from policy in Northern countries. And these studies suggest that Nordic countries should be much uh, less strict than uh, Southern countries because of structural reasons. So why would we, it seems we continue to think that there is one policy which fits every country and that I think is a mis fundamental mistake in the debate. It could be that, you know, different countries should have different policies. That's what the evidence suggests, uh, the evidence I am aware of. So it could be that, you know, the Swedish model is good in Sweden. It would be very bad in the UA and UK where they are having an explosive uh, number of deaths. So can we keep the possibility that different countries should have different policies? I think this is a, a question for Lars in particular, but maybe also for, for Peter. Lars? Yeah, no, I, I, I made a similar point in an article that came out yesterday, I wrote together with a, a Turkish colleague, uh, where we were emphasizing uh, building really on the classic book, Plagues and People by Willie McNeil, um, that points out that there is not just one universal pandemic, uh, they, are, they are all local, right? Uh, so I, I agree with the, this, this point. Uh, and I think that we, we do have to think that way. It's a tricky thing, right? Because uh, we've also heard the wise call for Nordic cooperation and for global cooperation around these issues. And I, I think we need to have several balls in the air at the same time. All of these are true. I, I, I think we see a certain degree of, I think, more emotional, what we can call Corona nationalism right now, where each country is rallying around its own leaders and its own flag. That may not be the best response, but we do have to be respectful of, of national traditions, constraints, possibilities. It, it could be having to do with culture. It could be the, 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 the healthcare system. It has to do with social structures. I've mentioned before why schools are so important in Sweden, why closing down the schools is not really an option. Uh, that's also, I think, why we see now in Denmark, Norway, and Finland, uh, a, a, a strong urge right, to, to open up again these schools. Uh, so there are these national differences uh, and I think we need to take those very seriously. Uh, and this is why it's important that in these modelings we don't only have people coming from the medical side. We have to have social science in there as well. We have to have economists who are sensitive to national economies. Uh, so I think that's a very important question and a very important point. Uh, I'm very happy that you raised that uh, matter. Can I, maybe can, I weigh, it, can I weigh in to agree that if you look at it historically, um, th there's never been a disease that was tackled by the same policies in every different country. Each country has its position differently on the learning curve. It has different socioeconomic demands on its authorities. Each country takes a separate approach. So in that sense, you're absolutely right. Just the most extreme example, the Netherlands in this case on one hand and New Zealand on the other. If you're an agriculturally self-sufficient nation and happen to be located on an island, you can preserve yourself very nicely and you can have, the last time I checked, I think New Zealand had one death. The Netherlands, you know, you might as well be living in a petting zoo. It's, there's nothing you can do to tr keep it out. And so you're, 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 the possibilities that you, you have, the hand that you've been dealt is so much different than that. Uh, in, in another kind of country. Can I call on uh, Michael Mück? Uh, hello, uh, I've got a question to, to Lars, uh, in particular with uh, regard to uh, the issue of school closures. Uh, there's a very high heterogeneity in Europe when it comes to co-residence of older people with uh, uh, their children or their grandchildren. In countries such as 
Poland, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, uh, very many school kids co-reside with their grandparents and, and share their households. Uh, um, from the point of view of the safety of the older population, uh, what do you think the school closure policy should be in this case? Thank you. Right. Uh, again, a very good question. And I think, again, it speaks to the question that we talked about earlier about national differences. Um, so I think that in a country where you have a more family-based uh, social structure, uh, it looks different from, let's say, Sweden, which has the highest rate of single-person residency in the world. Um, at the same time, uh, we also have to now that we know more, uh, and I mentioned very briefly this new study coming from Iceland, suggesting that in fact uh, children um, from under 10 don't appear right, to be a, either infecting or being particularly infectious towards others. Uh, uh, as we know more about that, we can make more rational decisions. But uh, earlier on, when we did not know that, of course, I would totally understand why in a country with you know, more complex households, uh, the question of closing schools would seem to be much, much more of an urgent matter than uh, in Sweden. So again, I think a very good point, and I think it just speaks to this fact that we do need to be sensitive to the particular culture and social structure uh, in any given country. Uh, Tom, you, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of introduced you wrongly, I guess, when I said you were an epidemiologist, but you are, you are um, a mathematician that's looked a lot at the uh, epidemiological um, processes. How, how, how would you see uh, these issues of differences across countries and different strategies? And so? uh, okay, well, first of all, let me say that uh, I think no, every modeler understands that uh, if you have a lockdown, there will be fewer deaths uh, from COVID-19. And clearly the Swedish health agency also realizes this. Uh, so uh, just so that there is no misunderstanding, the question is of course, how many lives does the, I guess it's very hard and delicate to comp measure these things, but how many lives do you save and to what price? I think that this, something that is considered and the Swedish Public Health Agency also has to count other, other uh, sort of uh, health issues. Uh, people are talking about the increased number of suicides as well. So they, they are not, it, the strategy is not only to minimize the number of case fatalities for COVID-19. Uh, and in terms of modeling, uh, it is quite hard to model. What is hard, the hardest of, every, of all is to predict what will happen in the future because that depends on how all of us behave. So that is the most complicated thing to say, what, how many will be infected in a month from now or even two weeks from now? I mean, if we everyone lock the door, no one more will be infected. If we start kissing and hugging, more or less everyone will get infected. So. It's not like many other situations, like there, there is a fixed line. Uh, but also the current situation is very hard and that will be improved now that soon the, these antibody tests will be available and then it will be a much clearer picture of what is the current step status. Now we have to rely on crazy mathematicians like me in order to get an estimate of how many that have been infected. I would more rely on hard numbers from these anti antibody tests. Maybe I can push you, Peter, also to, to speak to these uh, issues that, that Tom is alluding to, the sort of trade-off between the economic side and, and the health side. And, and, and what is sort of the historical evidence there? I mean, for example, going back to the flu, uh, the Spanish flu, and the, there's work I know on, on differences across U.S. states, for example. Have, do you have a, a sense of what these trade-offs look like historically? Well, I don't have it for, the, for 1918, but I certainly can tell you what it is for the cholera epidemics, where there were very clear discussions of can we afford quarantine because it means the shutdowns. And so nations, you know, Sweden imposed cholera quarantines because she was not really a trading nation at the time. England did not impose quarantines because it meant cutting off their lifeblood. And there were 
the same kinds of trade-offs, slightly cruder than, than today's uh, approach of ours, but the same sort of trade-offs between precisely the cure being worse or the, the solution being worse than the problem that it, that it solves. So there, there is a, a very interesting study that it, uh, I could recommend that um, looks at this, the uh, comparisons across U.S. states that shows that actually the, the, the states that had the, the most uh, sort of draconian uh, policies when it came to restrictions on people's mobility and so on actually had less economic uh, impact and actually grew faster than states that had. So it, you know, obviously there is there is some trade-off here, but you know we have to be careful when we draw too too strong conclusion. It, I I had um, uh, questions here from um, uh, the uh, Piroska Nord Mohaji uh, asking about the economic impact, uh, how it's been different in Sweden. Piroska, do you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, great panel. Um, so my question would be going in the direction of, of the economic impact. We've seen that in the health response, there is a difference. Why exactly from last we heard, uh, you know, certain set of uh, uh, proposals uh, um, and Professor Baldwin um, reminded us that perhaps it all comes down to, to her behavior, her, her uh, um, behavior related um, approach. Um, but what is the evidence on the different impact, uh, economic and financial sector impact uh, between countries um, which, uh, which uh, follow more sort of a, 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 a strict lockdown and, and those which don't, such as Sweden? So what is the economic, is there a, a measurable economic difference in the performance of, of, of these two different approaches, and particularly for Sweden? Less unemployment, less uh, the open income, less in consumption, the first figures, of course, is very early, consumption, production, exports, and others. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we saw a little slide uh, slipping by there at one point that showed some differences in economic impact uh, in the Scandinavian countries. Um, I can't remember now who was it Ola, that Ola was Ola presenting. Yeah. Was it Professor Ottersen, I think, had yeah. done. Maybe he wants to comment on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would like to jump in with a, with, a, with a caution here, because it's very important that we keep in mind that actually the markets between the Scandinavian countries, which one would easily get into com a comparison of right now, they're quite different. And we are, it's different industries, it's, it's, a, it's a very different um, labor market as well. So it's, uh, and we are, are at very different stages of the coronavirus and with the um, uh, uh, responses from the governments also varying a lot. So I think it's, I would really caution against drawing any conclusions at this stage in, in the process. Of course, we should learn from each of the individual state uh, countries and see what has worked and what hasn't worked. But I think that right now we cannot say that one, one intervention in one country is um, is the best uh, either to combat the the, the virus itself or uh, with regards to containing the economic uh, implications of the coronavirus. We are simply too early on in the process, and we have very different kinds of uh, uh, market structures and labor structures. Could you say something also about, uh, you know, the sort of political constraints to different policies? Is something that you, are there some policies that are more easily? Um, yeah, well, I mean, um, of course, it matters what kind of government you have in, in, uh, in place at the moment and where they are in their political cycles. So Denmark has, um, the Danish government has enjoyed a bit of a honeymoon period after the elections. It's a, a center-left government, so also different in that way. Um, and, um, and went out um, referring uh, mainly to the empirical um, evidence and the, the medical evidence that were given to them, uh, bringing in the medic chief medical advisors to, to sort of bring support to the government's interventions. And that was, uh, that was followed uh, very closely um, by the government. And I think that won them a lot of uh, support from, from the public. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm now curious to see how the next phase of opening up will, will, will play out because there's been some pushback in the public debate regarding uh, 
um, opening up the schools. So Lars says most parents are really uh, very much uh, opposed to the closing of the schools. Um, I think that um, uh, I have three kids, had them home at six, for six weeks now in London first and now in Denmark. I, I can definitely relate to that point. But here in Denmark, it's been interesting to see how uh, parents uh, have uh, have uh, argued against the opening of, of, of the schools because, because of the risk to how a phase would look like of maybe an increase in spread, but the objective all along not being to save lives only, but also to have the medical resources to deal with anyone who got ill. Because as we know, and as was presented earlier, with, uh, the evidence is that there's very high survival rates, uh, even if you get the virus, but if you cannot get any treatment, then it's a very different matter. And so that's how things have been communicated in Denmark, that we might see an increase in the rates again after the, uh, the, the, um, the schools open. But as long as there's medical resources uh, at hand, it should be possible to, to, to handle this. Okay. Uh, Ulle Petter, you have been uh, referred to several times now. Do you want to come in? on these differences in strategies? Yes, we're talking about uh, differences in strategies between the Nordic countries and of course the differences between the Nordic countries are not that great. But again, I would like to call on the need to talk about the global perspective here. Of course, the Nordic countries, they have much in common when it comes to the structure of their economies. And with the structure of their com economies goes the possibility that we all have to work from home, for example, if, uh, for example, universities are closed down. Uh, this possibility does not exist to the same extent in many other countries. So the tragedy about this pandemic is that uh, those countries that are rich, affluent, and uh, have a good uh, possibility to work from digital platforms, they will suffer much less than those countries that don't have these, uh, these um, possibilities. So uh, what we are looking at at a global level is that, uh, as I said, this pandemic will unveil, disclose all the inequities that we know are there, but we don't discuss them every day. Now we will see them straight in the eye. Uh, I have a question uh, from Pamela. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Yeah, yeah no, it was just a follow up. Uh, yes, Campa. And it was just a follow up on uh, Giancarlo's point uh, that uh, uh, probably we should think of uh, whether it makes sense to compare policies across countries. And one thing that I wonder is whether uh, we actually, the relevant dimension is more regional within countries even. Because I wonder whether the Swedish strategy can make sense for the for large, large part of the country uh, of relying on just individual responsibility sort of. Uh, but central, it might not make sense for central Stockholm, which is extremely crowded uh, and where there is more of a... And I don't know what are the limits to implement different policies, because on the other hand, uh, I'm Italian by origin and I live in Sweden. And in Italy, there is a sense that probably what has been necessary to do for Milan, a complete lockdown, uh, was not necessarily what, what was going to work, uh, what was needed for the countryside in the south of Italy. But then these national policies have been used and it's not obvious that this was optimal. I think this is a, a very good question. And of course, for many countries, uh, particularly in the developing world, these differences between the cities and the countryside can be very, very, very large. As well. And, and, and uh, you know, the other thing, maybe if someone wants to pick this up, uh, the other thing that's related to that is, of course, when you have federations like Germany, for example, where you have different policies at different uh, levels of, of government. And uh, in Sweden, you also have a division of responsibility. So elderly care is, is um, a responsibility of the municipalities. And while you know, many of these policies now uh, are at, regarding the, the COVID uh, strategy are at the national level. So if, does someone want to pick this up? Uh, I mean, from the political side, maybe uh, Sarah, you can say something about that and maybe someone could, Lars, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the um, differences between different parts of, of Sweden. 
Yeah. Um, do, do, Sarah, do you want to begin or should I start? You, you can go ahead if you uh, have something ready. Yeah, but, but just briefly, uh, uh, you know, clearly there are the big differences in Sweden, um, you know, in the, in the south, for example, but also up in the north, um, there is relatively little impact so far. And, uh, you know, Stock, Stockholm has much more. But uh, I want to connect this a little bit to a point that that was brought up um, by, by Peter earlier uh, around herd immunity, which, uh, as you pointed out, is not really an official policy here, but it's an implied, you know, there's an implied understanding at least that, uh, that, that this is, you know, in a way one of the, the choices in the long term. I mean, we don't have that many options, right? We either find a vaccine or a cure, uh, we achieve herd immunity, uh, or, you know, or I guess we all die. Uh, you know, the, 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 there are not that many options around. And one of the things that's happening in Stockholm, which, which uh, Tom was bringing out, which is interesting, even though it is not an official policy, is that we do see uh, certain potential advantages of, of a spread uh, in, in a Stockholm uh, community. Uh, there is not currently a, a healthcare crisis, which was actually the, a key objective of the health authorities. Uh, but we do see a spread, um, and at a certain point, of course, it will be large enough that uh, Stockholm would be a relatively safe place to be in. Uh, ironically, then, you know, those parts of Sweden that are uh, not affected at all, you know, will at that stage, you know, become more vulnerable. There's a certain paradox here which makes it all very, very complicated. Ultimately, of course, we're not gonna close borders uh, either within the country or between countries in Europe, uh, unless we truly you know, <laughs> want to shut down the economy for, for good. Uh, so I think ultimately uh, the, 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 these um, questions about separate policies uh, can only be um, tactical um, choices that we make in the short term, but they don't really have, I don't think, any, any long-term um, potential. Sarah, do you want to? Yeah. yeah so let another me... question, Sarah. There's another question, related question. I think to you. Okay. Also. Uh, just uh, on um, how do you see the Danish government? You said it had a, has had a bit of a honeymoon, uh, and and the question here uh, is from uh, someone uh, and and saying uh, basically, do you think this will help them also in the second phase, you know, as you're trying to reopen the, the um, economy and uh, reopen. Uh, I, I, I think this has, certain, this has certainly been the topic for, 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 for the government uh, coming in. Uh, it's a young government, it's a coalition, broad coalition, and there's, there are a lot of, of different uh, considerations in place. Um, that they have to, uh, a lot of considerations they have to take into account, but certainly it's, it's going to define this, this government uh, and, 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 um, uh, and everything going forward. But I think that's the case for, for uh, the other Nordic countries and, and uh, uh, governments are, uh, around the world, really. Uh, and and the, their responses and their ability to handle this very complex situation where they have to consider um, the uh, uh, health implications up until a point, but then beyond that, the, we see the social and the economic implications. We've seen the warning that, in fact, this virus will see most deaths, not by the virus itself, but by the economic poverty that comes out as a, as a consequence. Uh, um, of course, this is more the case in developing countries and not in the Nordic countries. But even in the Nordic countries, I, I might say to all of that we are very privileged uh, and it's not all uh, of our fellow citizens in the Nordic countries that are able to work online. There will be job losses. There are job losses already and there are people facing very, very difficult situations. But um, the political implications of all of this is really how the governments handle First, the immediate health response that has been uh, required, but then the economic and social implications that come after that. And we already see implications of the responses and the variation of responses across the Nordic countries. So different social groups, different geographical areas will, will experience this very, very differently. 
but um, you know, a concern um, that is uh, very present at the moment regarding the school discussion as well is that, of course, there are great inequalities in the access and the ability of students to um, learn online. Uh, and so while we will have inequalities even more pronounced across the Nordic countries uh, and across uh, the globe, uh, these inequalities are not only with regards to the health, but also with the implications of the economic consequences that come following this. And they are also present in the Nordic countries and issues that the Danish, the Swedish, uh, Norwegian governments are having to, to take very seriously in their decision making. Uh, but that's not quite yet. You know, right now it's the medical, it's the health issues that we are still dealing with. And then I think that, you know, we are gradually in Denmark starting to, 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 to be able to make decisions that are also of an economic and social nature, where I think that other places, and I think Sweden falls into that category of still having to deal with um, the immediate health issues. London is certainly, when I left London, I couldn't believe the difference when I came to, to Denmark. Um, but uh, London is, is uh, in a very dire place at the moment. And uh, of course, that is about health and health interventions in order to uh, contain the virus itself. But the economic and social implications are there too. Lars, did you want to come in again? Yeah, I just wanted to say one little thing there. You know, this it might just be a slight disagreement with Sarah there. Because my sense from comparing discussions around is that Sweden's advantage right now is that we do not need a debate about opening up because it's already relatively speaking open up. So I find the discussion here about other issues, including the labor market and economy uh, and more long term questions, uh, you know, around, you know, reforms of our uh, elderly care system, so forth, more mature. You know, I, I, because precisely because we don't have to go through this phase of a kind of a torture discussion about opening up. So there's an advantage here to the Swedish situation. Uh, Ole Petter, you had a question as well, or you wanted to get in as well? Well, I think Peter uh, and Sora, that took my point uh, really, but uh, uh, I, I could say that uh, it's extremely important at this point in time, of course, to focus on uh, the pandemic that we see as we speak, but we also have to have a long-term perspective when we do research, when you learn of the current situation, because as uh, I think we all agree, what uh, we will learn from this particular crisis is that uh, not only will there be differences uh, between countries, but also within countries. And the statistics from Stockholm is uh, not a very good one, because we see that uh, the underprivileged, uh, the vulnerable parts of the society, they are suffering a lot. So uh, to build resilience in the society, we have to learn what is from what is happening now, so that next time a pandemic hits, we will be better prepared. Maybe uh, sort of a, a last question for anyone who wants to, to um, comment on it. The, and it relates to what you said, you know, the extent of preparedness that um, there was in the Swedish uh, system for what's going to uh, for such an event as, the, as this one what can we say about that what is the sort of judgment uh, where was sweden well prepared where wasn't it so well prepared i think it's too early to say <laughs> lars you want to say something well i mean there is a big debate about that in sweden it's clear for example that our civil defense which was dismantled along with the military defense after the fall of the wall right uh, is, a, is a total disgrace um, and everybody is now looking very, very jealously towards Finland who never had any such illusions about uh, the Russians turning nice. Um, so, you know, here Sweden is, is clearly learning a lesson the hard way. Uh, the other lesson we're learning now is, is precisely to take the state seriously. You know, we've been dilly-dallying around with all kinds of reforms in recent years. We've seen a fraying social contract uh, and I think we're going to have a big discussion about taking the you know, state back in to the discussions. It may sound strange coming you know, for an uh, Anglo-American, but in Sweden right now, I think we haven't been taking that social contract seriously enough. 
And a crisis like this, the points that, that for example, Ulla brought up here uh, about the, the poor, the immigrant communities, the elderly, you know, that is super important questions. And those are already now entering into the middle of the debate in Sweden, which I think is a very, very good thing because these are long-term issues. This is not just a short-term crisis with Corona. These are long-term issues that we need to deal with and that, that we have not dealt with very successfully uh, in recent years. Okay. Peter, do you want to come in on this? Oh, sorry. Yes, I, I, I want to put my oar in um, for the last time, which is we've been talking a lot about trust, but arguably one could say that this, the open, the, the, the sort of laissez-faire, do nothing position uh, betrays a lack of trust. If you look at the, uh, at least a lack of trust in citizens being willing to undergo the kinds of sacrifices that the lockdown uh, implies. So when the Tories uh, were following, or not following, but you know, pursuing a similar st strategy to what the Swedes are doing now, before they took their their U-turn, uh, the reason why they didn't want to do a lockdown is they didn't think that the English citizenry would tolerate it. And that was despite you know all their sort of uh, image mongering about the spirit of the Blitz and that sort of thing. They didn't actually really think that that this, the English would put up with it. And I think there's something similar going on in in Sweden. So sort of the open policy is also a very populist policy. It is it is a kind of pandering to the lowest common denominator, demanding the least sacrifice. You could say turn it around and say that the lockdown policy actually requires a great deal more faith and trust on the part of the citizenry in their government. We'll agree to disagree on that one, Peter. <laughs> yeah. So, so is, does anyone else want to come in on this issue? So I think we are coming to, to an end to, to this very interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking discussion. As I said from the beginning, the, the the purpose of this was not to pass judgment on the Swedish um, experiment. Uh, the, it's too early, there are too many unknowns, there's too much uncertainty. Ulla Petter talked about the tremendous uncertainty that you face as a decision maker uh, when it comes to, to uh, a, a pandemic. The, um, you know, even now when we are in the midst of one, we have, there's so much uncertainty. Just looking at the biological uh, dimensions, you know, whether we will have a vaccine, whether there will be immunity, whether there will be antiviral treatments, uh, all those and all those issues are are not uh, really uh, we we're not they're not fully knowable at this point. Some we can make conjectures, but they are not really fully knowable. And so I, I think we what we wanted to do was to explain, of course, what the Swedish um, experiment was about. You know, and how, whether or not it fit into a sort of more general pattern of, of, uh, of how the Swedish uh, system works, and also how it looks in a sort of historical comparison. So, I think we have got that, and we are very grateful to the speakers and and to the many people who asked questions. I couldn't do justice to all the questions, and so. But thank you very much, and we look forward to um, hearing uh, more on this uh, debate. And we, of course, we will eventually learn uh, a lot more. It's uh, always like this in the, these uh, kind of uh, developments that you, it's not until you have gone through the whole thing that you fully understand what really mm -hmm. happened. And, and, and we don't have that luxury at, at this point. So um, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to the audience. And uh, thank you to everyone who helped uh, make this possible. Thank you.